In glory in Jesus' name, amen. You're now in the hands of the pastor. Let the church say amen. amen. Somebody give him a praise before you're seated this morning. Has God been good to you? He's a good God, isn't he? We love the Lord, for he has heard our prayer. Good to see you this morning in the house of the Lord. And uh, everybody shout, testify. testify. I've been preaching about testify. And even you who are traveling, many of you I know are watching live stream or catching up, Will, later on this afternoon. Uh, I want you to just say the word out loud, testify. Because this is, this is, this is what we're calling ourselves to do. Uh, the challenge for the church is to testify. So I'm going to look at Revelations 12 and 11, and then we're going to dive on into the scripture from there. And here's what the word says. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Can you say amen to the reading of his word? Amen. Testify. And I talked about testifying and we described what that is in the church and what that means in church lingo as well. But I'm trying to bring it home to capture what God intended for our testimony to be. Testify. To testify is simply to give witness to what God has done. Everybody say the word witness. To give witness to what God has done. If he changed your life, if he answered your prayer, if he's worked the miraculous, if he delivered right on time, if he reversed the curse, if he canceled out the plots of the enemy against you, if he healed what the doctor said could not be healed, if he's provided supernaturally, if he's brought you through the fire and the flood, if he restored what was lost, if he's kept you in perfect peace when all chaos had broken loose, then you have a testimony and to share that testimony is to testify. Is everybody with me today? And who has a testimony in the house? Shout amen. We introduced the power of testimony last week. And we learned that we are called and we are sent to be witnesses. In fact, we're reminded in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. He said, you shall receive power. Everybody shout power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be, say the word out loud, witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria. And here's where we are to the other most parts of the earth. Now, this is not speaking verse one and eight about the Holy Spirit convicting us of our sin and, and revealing Jesus to us. He's not talking about the work of the Holy Spirit that he does in regeneration at our salvation. This is not talking about the Holy Spirit doing the work of sanctification on us and in us. But rather, this is the promise called Holy Spirit baptism that's offered to all born again believers. And it is a promise to empower in fact, the Greek word for power here literally means force. It's usually used when referring to the supernatural. So what Jesus would have been saying in the Greek would be, you shall receive supernatural force or explosive power to be witnesses unto me. In other words, you need to go and testify in the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit. Everybody with me? Say amen. amen. In other words, you don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be skilled in apologetics. You don't have to have profound philosophical understanding. You don't even need to have well-honed debate skills. What you need is to have a testimony and the power 
of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear me this morning, church? To do what Jesus is calling us to do, what you need is a testimony and the power of the Holy Spirit. We've become so dependent on intellectualism that we have excused away our need for the Holy Spirit in our lives. We have placed so much emphasis on winning an argument or being right that we have placed Holy Spirit power on a shelf. We have practiced our talking points, but we are not reliant on the anointing. We have allowed the popular culture to shape the narrative and to take the lead while failing to be led by the Holy Spirit in reaching this generation. But here's my goal. My goal is to recapture the call to go out everywhere and look for every opportunity to testify, to recapture the truth that, that we don't have to do this on our own. But there is a promise, a spirit baptism, and he will help us do beyond our own ability to do it by ourselves. So when I share with the unbeliever and I share from my own intellect, I'm speaking intellect to intellect. But when I do it in the anointing of the Holy Spirit, then I share from my intellect but the Holy Spirit working with me is working on the heart. And it's from the heart that one believes and it is from belief that one confesses. Are you with me this morning, church? We need the Holy Spirit, but we also need to be testifying. Somebody shout testify. And we need to testify in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, remember from last week, I said this, a good testimony, a good testimony will encourage somebody. A good testimony will build somebody's faith up. A good testimony will always bring glory to God and it will produce worship. So if you're going to reach the loss, if you're going to reach people for Christ, a good testimony will always point men to Jesus. A good testimony says this, look what the Lord has done. A good testimony will say this, if it had not been for the Lord on my side. You know, I'm going to give you all a homework assignment. I want you to go home, pull out a, a tablet, Get your big chief notebook and pull it out and write down your testimony. Begin it with this. If it had not been for the Lord on my side and just start writing. Or you can start it like this. Look what the Lord has done and just start writing. Right till you start crying. Right till you start shouting. Right till your hands go up and you realize how much God has done in your life. Write your testimony and get it in your spirit. Are you with me, guys? That's your assignment. Maybe next week you'll come back with it ready to testify. I don't know. But do something with it. Write your testimony. Uh, there's a song I hadn't heard in years. Maybe everyone uh, in the house has heard it. It said, he's been so good to me that I cannot tell it all. Y'all know that song? He's been so good to me that I cannot tell it all. All. I may not be able to tell it all. You may not be able to tell it all, but we need to be telling something somewhere to somebody. We need to testify. Amen. Because here's the truth about testimonies. Testifying is really a high form of worship. Did y'all catch that? Testifying is really a high form of worship because when we talk about worship, a lot of times we think, well, worship is all in the music and, and that's a big giant part of it in our circles. We like a catchy tune with a danceable beat that works us up in the house of God and we call that worship. But if we're not careful, that can often be surface worship with very little depth. But the songs we sing become richer when they involve testimony. Have you ever had a song that was your testimony? As soon as it comes on, the words testify what God's done for you and you stand to your feet, your hands go up and you sing it with all you got. We're talking about testifying. That's why this pastor lyrics of songs we sing is a big deal. 
My wife knows there's been a couple of times in our 30 something years of marriage that I've uh, shut down a song. I said, no, we're not going to sing that in the church. It's got to be right. It's got to be doctrinally right. It's got to be word right. It's got to be attitude right. Because the songs that we sing can be our testimony. We have a praise manual in the Bible. It's called the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is an ongoing book of flowing with testimonies. The psalmist testifies over and over in the lyrics of the songs that he writes. And you can look at some of them, such as Psalm 3 and 5. He said, I laid down and slept. I awoke because the Lord sustained me. That's his testimony. In Psalm 16 and 6, the lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Yes, I have a good inheritance. That's my testimony. In Psalm 18 and 6, in my distress, I called upon the Lord. I cried out to God and he heard my voice from his temple and my cry came to his ears. That's his testimony in Psalm 18 and 9, he said, he also brought me out into a broad place and he delivered me because he delighted in me. He testified in Psalm 56 and 13, for you have delivered my soul from death and you have uh, kept my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living. In Psalm 116 and 6, he, pres he testified this, the Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Psalm 40 and 2, he said, he has brought me out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay and set my feet upon a rock and he established my steps. That's his testimony. But if you really want to know David's testimony, he sums it up in 23rd Psalm when he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything because he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even when I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear evil because he is with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for, for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Here's the testimony. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I plan to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Anybody got that testimony? Shout amen. amen. That was David's summary. He is testifying and we read it today with joy. If you pay attention. The scripture is full of people testifying. Some of the greatest praise hymns in the Old Testament are people testifying. When Sarah bore Isaac miraculously, she testified, the Lord has caused me to laugh. When the Israelites were led through the sea, Miriam testified while the women beat tambourines. When God gave Hannah a promised child, she broke out in a song of testimony. When God delivered Israel in a military victory by the hand of Deborah, she declared the testimony in a song of praise. And if you look in the gospel, Jesus healed so many people, delivered so many from demonic spirits. He did so many miracles that the scripture says his fame spread abroad through all the land. How? Because people went everywhere testifying what Jesus had done. Even when Jesus said, hey, don't tell anybody who did this, they went out and said it anyway. I couldn't contain it. I have to tell somebody. They went and made Jesus famous. How long has it been since we made him famous? Aren't y'all ready to make Jesus famous in the Cape Town, Ramstein area? It's time we make Jesus famous again. Go everywhere telling people what God has done. You look through the Gospels, that's what was happening. One man said, I was a leper. 
But then I met this man, Jesus. Another said I was condemned to death, but I found mercy at the feet of this man, Jesus. I was out of my mind, possessed with demonic spirits until a man named Jesus spoke with authority and set me free. The woman or the man that had been blind been stood before the priest and testified whether this man, Jesus, is a sinner or not. I don't know, but one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. The early church went everywhere testifying that Jesus was alive. Paul gave his testimony everywhere of his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. Somebody shout testify. Do we have a testimony to share with this generation? Do you have a testimony to tell somebody what God has done Let's look at our opening text again in Revelation 12 and 11. Look what happens. It says, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Who overcame? Well, this passage is not past tense. It's future tense. We're looking at John the Revelator, and he's showing us a thing, a view of things to come. Things uh, will happen in the end times, in the last days. So if you read up to chapter 12, we will see that the seven seals have already been opened. That means the Antichrist has risen the power. The beast has been let loose. The church is enduring persecution and the systematic release of war and famine and pestilence and death have already unfolded. Now we see that the seven trumpets are being sounded and persecution is now focused on the land of Israel. The beast and his false prophet have already made himself out to be a god. Two witnesses sent from heaven have been slain. The 144,000 in time evangelists are valiantly testifying that Christ is the Lord in the land of Israel under fierce and demonic opposition and persecution. Yet songs are being sung in heaven and worship is taking place in the heavenly as the resurrection raptured sing and testify about their redemption. And then the basis of their, of their endurance is declared in verse 11 of chapter 12. They overcame him who Satan by the blood of the lamb. Can somebody praise God? And they overcame him who Satan by the word of their testimony. Now the blood of the lamb. What does that mean? That means these people were born again. They overcame because they belong to the Savior, the Redeemer. The redeemed belong to Him. So they were living the dynamic reality of being the redeemed. What does this mean? That means that, that, that they overcame Him because they had something working on their behalf that worked it out in their favor, and that was the blood of the Lamb. See, Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. This implies that Satan constantly builds a case against men for their condemnation. When he as Lucifer rebelled against God, he was cast out of heaven and now dwells in utter darkness. He is pure evil because he is absolutely absent of the presence of God. But when men rebelled, God found a means of redemption for him. And you can imagine how ticked off Lucifer had to be in, that when he rebelled, he gets cast out. When man rebels, he gets a lifeline. And so he hates us and he accuses us. And so he says, if I'm destined for destruction, I'm going to take as many of mankind with me as I can. He despises the image of God in us and would take pleasure in sharing in his end. But God, God provides a means to shut the mouth of the accuser. Romans 8 and 1 tells us this. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who are not walking according to the flesh but according to the spirit. In other words, Satan can accuse us 
all day long. But to those who are in Christ, there is no condemnation. He can talk about you all day long. But for those who are covered in the blood, he hasn't a case to stand against us. And that's why in Colossians 2, 13 through 15, pay attention to this. He said, now you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he is now made alive together with him, having forgiven all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to his cross, Get verse 15. He has disarmed principalities and powers, made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. In other words, every rule and regulation, every edict and indictment that declared us guilty were nailed to the cross of Jesus. Therefore, our old sins, our trespasses, our unrighteous deeds, we have been forgiven, wiped out our past, thus giving us a new slate. Are you hearing me this morning, church? Psalm 103 best describes it in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions against us. Anybody happy about it this morning? And look, by doing so, he caused us to triumph over the weapon of the enemy, and that is his condemnation and accusations. Verse uh, 1, 7 and chapter 1 of Ephesians says, In him we have redemption through what? Say it out loud. Even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. This is why they overcome Satan by the blood of the lamb. If you've got the blood of the lamb, you're an overcomer. Somebody ought to praise the Lord this morning because you already have something in your court that makes it work out in your favor. But notice, first of all, That they overcome by the blood of the lamb, but they also overcome by their testimony. But I asked the church this morning, is it your testimony that you have the blood of the lamb? Now, what does that mean to you? First of all, it means that we're born again. If I say born again. And, and, and there's a lot of theological words we use. We're saved. We're redeemed. We're, we're born again. We're regenerated. We're sanctified. We're justified. All of these, these are, we're also transformed. These are biblical words that you find in the New Testament. And really, when you get down to it, they all kind of mean the same thing. But each word theologically has its own place. Sanctification is not quite justification and so forth, but all of them work together and they are all an act of the, are provided in the blood of Jesus Christ and an act of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So, so when you look down to it, when you really get down to it, when you're born again, you're now redeemed, you're saved, you're justified, you're sanctified, you're regenerated and you're transformed. Now that's a whole bunch of stuff going on in us when we come to Christ. Now, now what does that mean to us? It means that, that, that all of these apply when we're born again. This work is provided by the blood of Jesus and is applied through the operation of the Holy Spirit. Listen, it is not turning over a new leaf. This is spiritual. It's not just mere mental assent to Jesus. This is supernatural. It's not just a decision to follow new rules and regulations for living. It is a change of heart and a change of spiritual status. That's why 1 Peter 2 and 9 says this. You are now a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, so that you may proclaim, testify the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Wow, isn't that amazing? I'm the only one excited about it, but that's all right. That's my testimony this morning. When you're saved, listen guys, when you're saved, there is a transfer that takes place. There is a change of kingdoms. 
There is a change of residency. There is a change of heart. There is a change of lifestyle. You were a stranger, but now you're a friend. You are afar off, but now you have been drawn near. You were an orphan, but now you are a son or a daughter. You walked in darkness, but now you abide in his light. You were spiritually blind, but now you see. You were guilty and condemned, but now you're justified and declared free. You were identified by your past, but now you are identified by him. You were destined to hell, but now you have a place in the Father's house. And all of this, because he paid the price for our sin with his own blood. Woo. Well, y'all are a tough crowd today. This all I have you running the aisles and buck dancing. Y'all, that's just, this is where I'm really kind of going with our testimony this morning. Because listen, guys, uh, if we have a testimony that we are in Christ, then we need to be sharing our testimony. But listen, I'm going to get to this in just a second. But, but in case you're here this morning and say, Pastor, that's not my testimony. I don't want to not tell you how to make it your testimony before I go any further in this sermon. Amen. First of all, I, I, one of the things you've got to do is believe. And what do you need to believe? That Jesus was sent from heaven as the only begotten son of God. That he lived a sinless and holy life teaching us righteousness and then died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And we believe that he arose again on the third day and ascended to the right hand of God and is there as our high priest making intercession for us. You believe this, then you're ready to, to, to be saved. Secondly, the scripture talks to us about repentance. That's simply turning away from the unbelief and sin of our past and turn to Christ and acknowledge that our sins, acknowledging our sins and turn to him for cleansing and forgiveness. So we believe and when we repent and then we call upon him, the Bible tells us, call upon the Lord and you shall be saved. The scripture says all who call upon the Lord shall be saved. So it's simply asking him to save you. And then finally, there is confession. Everybody say confess. And that means confess him to be the Christ, the son of the living God. As Peter did when Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And then confess him as your Lord and Savior. Because Romans 10 tells us, whoever confesses this shall be saved. That's not too hard, is it? So we, we, we believe and we repent we call upon him and we confess. Everybody with me today? It's not rocket science. You don't have to be cut off from God this morning. You, he, God, God doesn't want you to be cut off from him this morning. You don't have to die in your sins and then face the penalty of sin for eternity. God doesn't want you to die in your sins, but rather all men come to repentance. So, so that is why Jesus says that whoever comes comes unto me, I will in no ways cast out. That's why the scripture says, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is why he invites the whosoevers to come to him. And so if you are a whosoever who believes, I encourage you, I urge you, I beg you to make this the day you come and make him your savior. Can somebody say amen? amen. All the saved people in the house say amen. Now, 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 everybody knows what we're talking about when it comes to being saved. I want to get down to where I want to take us. And that is our new birth, our born again experience. The fact that he saved us and redeemed us is our testimony. Listen, when we are far removed from our own redemption, we often lose the joy of our salvation. It, it was, it's been 30, almost 40, I don't know how many years it's been since I got saved. I got saved in 1983. Y'all count it up. That's too much math for me this morning. Before a bunch of y'all were even born, I got saved. I was 17 years old. That's a long time. 
But I promise you, sometimes, sometimes when I start thinking about what the alternative could have been, when I look at some of my family members and siblings who didn't get saved, and I look at some of my buddies who lived in the same neighborhood lifestyle from which I got saved out of and where they are today, I start shouting all over again and thank God that he saved me. Does anybody ever do that? Sometimes you got to revisit your new birth experience and sometimes you got to testify it to some people about it so that the joy of your salvation continues to keep you worshiping happy about it. Y'all with me, guys? It's, it's not that difficult for us to revisit where God has brought us. And so when we are saved and years go by from the time that God saved us, it becomes kind of like a fact of our past rather than the living dynamic of our, of our present. And so, so when we testify, though, when we tell people our testimony, it's like we're celebrating all over again that he saved us. When we testify, we're also reminding the enemy that he lost. When we testify, we're also using the power of our testimony to reach others who need to be saved. Somebody shout testify. I, I, I want to introduce you to this couple, Wayne and, and Nanette Janeway. I, I've known them for a good 20 something years, 30 years, because I was their pastor. Now, here, here's the thing about Wayne Janeway. Wayne was not always saved, like all of us. Wayne used to be what they call an enforcer in a motorcycle gang. Does anybody know what an enforcer is in the bike gang? They're the guys that go break legs and break thumbs and fingers and enforce the rules and go punish the rule breakers and so forth. And so his job, and Wayne's a big dude. He's, uh, he towers over me. Uh, I used to try to arm wrestle him. I, I lasted half a second. You know, he has these huge hands like vice grips. He's a, a tattoos all over him. If you ran into him in a dark alley, you would probably have to change your, your shorts because he's scary looking. But, 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 but he, he's, a, he's a big guy. But he was an enforcer in a bike gang. He also ran for this bike gang in Houston a prostitution ring on the west side of the city and a drug wing that he ran. And that involved all the crime and ugliness that's involved in prostitution and drugs. He was in and out of jail. He was in and out of fights, in and out of the hospital. But eventually uh, his heroin addict uh, addiction and alcoholism got him into a sloppy lifestyle where his guard was let down. And eventually his heroin addiction got him landed in prison. And so Wayne spent several years in prison and in prison there again, he took charge and began to lead gangs in the prison as well. But when he gets out of the prison, he goes right back to his addiction and his life got so low that one day he was laying there realizing after coming out of a heroin high that if I do this again, I won't survive. He dwindled down to almost nothing. He says, if I, if I don't stop what I'm doing, I'm going to die. And if I die, I'm going to wake up in hell. How did he know that? Because he had a praying mama who was interceding for her son that God would save and deliver him. So he knew the truth and he knew that God had his number. Laying on the floor, vomit all around him sick and his body racked in pain and shaking in agony. He says, God, if you get me through this, I will call upon you. And I'm asking that you would save me. Just help me get through this night. And God helped him get through that night. The next day he cleaned himself up. The next weekend he found himself into a church. When the altar call came, he found himself at the altar. He laid across one of these praying benches and he says, God, if I'm going to do this, if you're going to save me, 
I also need you to deliver me from heroin. I want you to deliver me from alcoholism and my addiction, and I will serve you. And he cried at that altar. He said that, it, I don't remember how long he was there, but people prayed with him and he wouldn't get up till he knew he was going to live this thing. He gave himself to the Lord. Jesus saved him, forgave him of his sins. Yes, all of his sins, the worst of the sins. God saved him. He stood up a son, redeemed, saved, sanctified, uh, transformed. And he says that from that day forward, he never craved heroin. He never craved alcohol. He didn't go the 12 step. He didn't take methadone. He didn't take drugs. He absolutely was delivered from addiction by the power of the blood of Jesus. And he began to serve God. He said, as much as I serve the devil, I'm going to make my mind up to serve God. That's, that's Wayne. Next to him is his wife, Nanette. Now, she also was not always saved. She also lived a life of addiction. She did alcohol and she did heroin and she was addicted to every kind of pill that she could get her hands on, legal and illegal. Her life disrupted so much that, that the county took away all her kids because she was living such a destructive life. When she got to the bottom of the barrel, she herself became a prostitute. We call them truck stop prostitutes. She would hang around the truck stops and she prostituted in the truck stops to get her next fix. She was in dire, dire straits. She was whittled down to nothing skinny and barely hanging on to life. But then she got a hold of, or someone got a hold of her, a faith-based organization that helped reach people like her, got a hold of her and gave her an opportunity, a lifeline to get out of the lifestyle she was in and to get herself clean. And she jumped on it. And in this organization, she became free from her drugs. She began, she learned about about salvation. She gave her heart to Christ. She got discipled and she got full of the spirit and God began to transform her life. And she became a prayer warrior for God. When she got released from this program, she found herself a local church. She looked across the church. There was big Wayne sitting they locked eyes. They connected. They got married. And then around this time, they were wound up in my church when they moved to the Houston area. They were brand spanking new Christians. They were still on fire for God. And they still uh, were, had a lot to learn. Wayne at this time was smoking four packs of cigarettes a day. He hadn't shed that habit yet. And I remember when he walked up to me, I had been preaching the Holy Spirit and, 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 and he says, you know what, pastor, I want the Holy Spirit and I want to be a witness. And God's convicted me that if I'm going to be a witness, I can't be talking about how God delivered me and I'm smoking four, four packs of cigarettes a day. I said, well, praise the Lord. That's something God's working on you. Then just give it to him. He goes up to the altar. He says, I'm going to do it like I did with heroin and alcohol. He laid on the altar, say, God, break, take this away from me. And God, he got up from the altar. He says, I'm done, pastor. I said, all right. In my mind, because I've worked with people with different addictions, I said, he may still struggle. No, he did not. He never craved another cigarette, never went back, threw him away. And God cleaned him up completely, filled him with the Holy Spirit. They became a prayer warrior team in our church. He joined the choir. He was a big old scary dude, but he'd get up there and sing and tears come down his face and people would be blessed. Listen, I'm telling you their story and their testimony because I want you to know that you can never write off anybody. The worst of the worst in society, the one you think is too far gone. Those are the very ones that God is still able to save and deliver. And I'm here to tell you that God's still in delivering business. Amen. We're still friends. They're still in church. It's been years and they're still serving God with all they have. Listen, God can save to the uttermost. And I'm asking you today, do you have a testimony? Do you know how many people they reach with their testimony? People that think they're too far gone. People that think they've sinned too much or their sins are too ugly. These two guys can tell you about ugly. And they go and they share their testimony and people get hope. Hope that if God can save that, he can save me. If God can deliver him, he can deliver me. If God showed him love, he can love me as well. That's the truth. We need to learn how to share our testimony. Can somebody say amen? amen. Listen, 
We're talking about being transformed, turned around, made new creatures. That's the power of testimony. While, while the Buddhists are out there trying to escape suffering through becoming nothing, where is the testimony in their life of deliverance and the transfer life? Where, while the Jehovah Witnesses are out there knocking on doors, trying to clock enough hours to become a member of the Jehovah Witness movement, where is their testimony of becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus? While the culture is trying to figure out if they're male or female, bisexual or sisexual or transsexual or pansexual or binary or multilateral or multipurpose? Where is the testimony of being delivered and adopted into the family and being called son and daughter of the most high God? Do you have a testimony? I know who I am and why I am what I am. Ooh. Am I going too fast? Uta? I got five minutes. I've shared this story here. I'm going to share it for a new group. Our testimony of salvation. That's what I'm going to preach today. But next week I'll talk about other things that God has done in our lives. That are worth telling and sharing everywhere you go. But your testimony of how he saved you is one of those. I'm not like my wife who grew up in church. The wife, the daughter of a former pastor, the granddaughter of two pastors, generations of church families, singing families. I, I don't know if she really remembers a moment where she wasn't saved. <laughs> and that's cool. That's a testimony in itself. Yeah. But Lord knows that's not my testimony. When I was pastoring in Texas... I often share this story when I want to talk about how the Holy Spirit leads us, his role in leading us. And, but today I'll share it in his role in saving people wondrously and beautifully. But I was out on the riding mower on our church property mowing the grass one Saturday morning. And that's when I usually have my best prayer time. Because I'm on the mower two, three hours, four hours, no disturbance, noise dr drowned out. And I just talk to God and worship, get my best sermons on the riding mower. I need a riding mower here. I don't know where I'd use it. And I don't know if they have them here. But, but I was on that mower and the Holy Spirit kept nudging me. Go, go fill the baptistry up. Which was weird because I hadn't planned to baptize anyone. A little bit longer, I was mowing, and it hit me. You need to go put water in the baptistry. And after about the third time, I stopped the mower, and I went, turned on the water in the baptistry, went back to mowing. I said, all right, Lord. I, I just did it and obeyed, but when I finished mowing, my, I went and checked my cell phone, and my wife had left a message and says, hey, are you still at the church? Marilyn from Ruby's Barber Shop's been trying to reach you. She's been calling here and she's desperate. I called my wife. I said, hey, call Marilyn. I'm at the church. Why don't you come meet me here and tell Marilyn come see, to see me at the church? Marilyn was a barber at our barber shop in our small town where everybody went. Everybody went. It was a whole bunch of barbers. Everyone loved them. Everybody got their hair cut there. The whole town went there, talked, visited, got their haircuts, and everyone loved Marilyn. But Marilyn had gotten cancer. She had been fighting cancer. She had lost all her hair. She was skin bald. And everybody had been rooting for Marilyn. But she shows up at the church. My wife and I meet her, and we sit in the sanctuary just like this. I'm sitting here on the altar, Marilyn, my wife, sitting side by side. And Marilyn begins to tell me, she says, Pastor, this cancer is taken over and it doesn't look like I'm going to make it. She said, but I realize that I'm not ready to die. I'm afraid to die. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. And the only one I knew to come to was you being the pastor 
She said, I want to know what I need to do to make sure I'm going to be all right. And I sat there and teared up. I said, Marilyn, every pastor longs to hear these words. Nothing more beautiful in the ears of a pastor than what you're saying right now. And I talked to her about salvation. I told her about the new birth and what that would mean once she was saved. And tears were rolling down her face uncontrollably. I said, Marilyn, is that what you want? And she stood to her feet and she said, Pastor, that's exactly what I want. (laughs) I said, well, come on, kneel. And she knelt at this prayer bench like this. And I led her in that prayer. And I was trying to lead her in a nice, clean, sanitized sinner's prayer. And she just cut me off. And she cried out to God with all she had. And cried out, said, God, forgive me. Forgive me for waiting so long. Forgive me for my life living without you. But Lord, if you'll have me, here I am. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me. I believe. And she just prayed like she knew what to pray. And with all she had, she cried. And when we finished praying, I said, Marilyn, do you believe what you prayed? She said, yes. Do you believe he heard you? She goes, I know he did. I said, then you are cleansed. Your sins are forgiven. Your past is gone. He wrote your name in his book. You are now his daughter. And if you died today, you would meet him face to face. I'm kind of jealous you're going to get there before me. But listen, it's yours. And she says, thank you. I need to be baptized now. I said, I'll baptize you. And I told her what the Holy Spirit made me do, fill the baptistry. And she said, then she knew this was a God thing. I said, yeah, it's a God thing. And so I said, all right, I'll baptize you tomorrow morning, but you need to invite all your family and all your friends. That Sunday morning, Marilyn comes ready to be baptized and our, the church house was packed. People were standing along the back wall and along the side of the walls. All the people who come to Ruby's Barbershop were there. All the barbers were there. Every person, all the football team, because all the football team players on the school at the high school got their haircuts there. They were all there to see Maryland baptized. It was a packed house. I preached the message of salvation. We baptized Maryland. There was great joy in the house. That Monday, she went into the hospital or she went down. Uh, She was in there for the week. We, the next Sunday, that Sunday night, we took the church to the hospital and worshiped with Marilyn around her bed. And she worshiped God with her last ounce of strength. And that next morning, she went on to be with the Lord. We did her funeral. When we had her funeral at the church, I had her at at the altar, her casket here at the front of the pulpit. And when I told the story, the testimony of Maryland's salvation, I then said, how many of you want to join Maryland in entering into the kingdom of God? 23 young adults walked up to the front of the church and stood around a casket of a woman who had died and gone on to be with glory and accepted the Lord into their hearts. Let me tell you something, church. One testimony is enough to reach another and create another testimony to reach another and create another testimony. And the kingdom of God is building up and growing from one testimony to the next. And that is why I'm saying, have you told your testimony? Are you sharing the testimony of what Christ has done in your life? Because by sharing, you create another testimony. Listen, you don't have to be a Bible scholar to do it. You just have to know where God has brought you from. Stand with me this morning, church. Somebody shout testify. Testify. Brian, if you would come, please. I don't know how to get this into our spirit, but I do challenge you to do your homework. Go home and write your testimony. Write it out. Because God may have you share it real fast because I've been praying that God brings people in your path and gives you divine setups where you have to share or get to share your testimony. And so get ready, church. That's why I'm telling you, write it out. If it had not been for God's intervention, this is where I would have been. If God hadn't come on in time, this is where I might have landed. But thank God, look what he has done in my life. That's your testimony. Every head bowed, please. So let me ask you this morning as we meditate in his presence and 
stand before the Lord. Are you ready to create your testimony today? Or rather, are you ready to allow him to create a testimony in you? If you're not saved, if you're not born again, and you understand it clearly, and you say, Pastor, yeah, I, I, I want this. I know this is what I need in my life right now. Uh, the altars are open. I want you to come kneel. And one of our elders will come pray with you. You don't have to pray by yourself. But if you know how to pray and you know what to do, come quickly. Find a place to kneel. And listen, if you've been distant from God, running from God, strayed from God, God hasn't gone anywhere. The Father has always kept a robe in the closet for you and he wants to put it on you. Say, welcome home. So, so, so isn't this the day to say, okay, Lord, I'm tired of I'm tired of the pig pens. I know who you are and what you have for me. He's in the restoring business and he'll restore. He wants to create a testimony in you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that no one leaves this place. No one leaves this place without a, a testimony of salvation redemption, transformation, a new life. Holy One, I'm asking that you would convict. Holy Spirit, do what you do best. Convict hearts and reveal Christ that men may know that you are Jesus, the risen Savior of the world. I release it into this congregation preaching it in its fullness. Father, would you do your work in the hearts of people? Here's what I'm going to pray. Now, I'm going to, if you lift your hands toward heaven, and if this is you, you say, Lord, I want to share my testimony with somebody. I want to tell what God has done in my life. If that's you, lift your hands towards heaven. I'm going to pray for you. I can't make you do it. It's your testimony, not mine. But if you're ready to share... I want you to lift your hand toward heaven. Father, in the name of Jesus, we send these out as missionaries in this community. They are connected to people that no one else is. They know people no one else knows. They interact with people that they uniquely are interacting with. And so I'm asking that you would anoint them with the presence of the Holy Spirit to go share. God, give them divine opportunities. And when the opportunity arises, let them know that it's from you. Say, oh, here's a God moment. And let them speak with boldness. Father, give them moments this week. Let them come. Lord, of what you did. God, we send them out with power and mission in the name of the Lord most high. Give them spiritual eyes to see the harvest in front of them. Holy one, we ask in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Before I dismiss, before I turn this over to our brother Mac, if you're here in the house, you need special prayer. You need healing. We, we believe in the laying on of hands, the anointing of oil of the sick, according to James chapter 5 and Mark 16. And we pray the prayer of faith. Believe the presence of the Lord restores and heals and renews. If that's you today, I won't pray with you. Come quickly. It's why we gather. The gathered church, authority of agreement. So don't come to the house of the Lord and walk out without having the church agree in prayer. Is there a special need you want us to agree with you in prayer? Come quickly, and I'll do so in the name of the Lord. Come on. Any others, come. Come.